Today, I want us to, to look at an aspect of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are so many aspects of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So today, I want us to look at an ignored aspect of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but a very critical, very important aspect of the gospel of Jesus Christ that if you get to understand it, your prayer life is going to change. How you see God is going to change. How you relate with God is going to change. Because today, that is what God has put in my heart and he wants me to present to Kenya God as a father. We have known him as a miracle worker and that is good. We have, we have known him as a powerful God and that is good. We have known him as a God that makes way where there is no way and that is good. We have known him as a healer and that is good. We have known him as a provider and that is good. But many people, they do not see God as a father that provides. There are many who want the, they want the provision but they do not really want to have a relationship with the provider. So today, I want to project this aspect of the good news of Jesus Christ and today by the, by the help of the Spirit I am going to reveal to us the heart of God because the heart of God is the heart of a father. Yes, God has been misrepresented but today, this morning, I want to make a case for God. I want to, call, to project him as a good father. I want to project him as a good father and a caring and as a protective father and I know if you receive this word Word. Yes, as a word that is coming from God, your life is going to change forever in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, religion uh, uh, has, has uh, projected, uh, first they project, the religion has mostly projected the hand of God instead of his heart. So you find that anybody who comes into the faith, the thing that they always seek for is the hand of God. But God is saying, no, that, that's not how it was supposed to be. It was supposed that you know me as your father, and then you will, after you know me as your father, then what I can do becomes obvious in your life. So religion has, uh, has magnified. It's not that God is not powerful. It's not that God does not provide. But religion has magnified God. They have mag the religion has magnified the hand of God above his heart. And God desires for us to see his heart. Amen. And before I continue, just raise your hand and say, I am born of God. I am born of the Spirit of God. Therefore, I cannot fail. I am born of God. The world is mine. For the Bible says that all things are mine. I know I cannot fail in life because greater, mightier, stronger is the one that is in me, not the one that is in the world. I am a victor. I win always. I do not know failure because I am the seed of Abraham. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us in the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to verse 27, we are going to see God as our father this morning. The Bible says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion. So when he said man, he meant the man and the woman. Okay? Let them. That's why he says let them, not let him. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So that was God's initial desire. He said that he desired to make man in his own image. He did not want to make man anything that was different from who he is. Yeah, so the Bible says that God said, let us make man in our own image, in our likeness, and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air. But many times we consider, we look so much on the aspect of dominion, and we forget the aspect of likeness. Amen. Yeah, the Bible says that first I want this man to be like me. Okay, and then after this man has been like me, if this man is like me, then obviously he's going to have dominion over the cattle and over everything that I have created as God. So we find that the, the heart, the, the heartbeat of God from creation, from creation was for him to have a family. You know, God does not need us to be God. 
He, he was God in eternity past before man was created. He has always been God. And nothing, there is, there is not, no amount of worship that will make him more God than he is already God. There is nothing that man will ever add to God. Praise the name of Jesus. So he was God before Genesis chapter 1. He was God before Genesis chapter 1. But God was not lonely. He did not create man because he was lonely. God created man because he desired to have a family. He wanted a people that were like him. He wanted a people that he could communicate with. And that is why the Bible tells us that before the fall, God would come and commune. He would come and have fellowship with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. So God desired a people that were like him so that he could be able to fellowship, people he could be able to communicate, people who were at his level of communication that he could communicate with because he desired People that were like him. He desired to have a family. And now the people that were supposed to be his family, he desired that, that his family will have dominion over everything else that he created. And that is why the Bible tells us in the book of Luke, in the book of Luke, chapter 3 and verse 38, I don't want, I can't, uh, I just want to look at something there. The Bible says, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. So here Adam is referred to as the son of God. He is not referred to as a servant of God. He is referred to as the son of God. And this now begins to project to us the initial desire on how God desired to relate with the man that he created. That is why the Bible says that Adam was the son of God. But you find that now after Adam, that aspect of sonship came to an end because of what happened in the garden of Eden. Are you with me somebody? So I am saying this to emphasize that God desired to have a family and that is why he created and made Adam. Yes, he first created and then he made him, praise the name of Jesus and then he put him in a garden and this shows us the kind of an environment that God desired this family to be able to live in. The Bible tells us in the book of Genesis chapter eight, verse, chapter 2 verse 8 to verse 9 and kindly pay attention even to to those who are watching with me because if you walk with me this journey that I am starting all the way from the book of Genesis I am transversing all the way into the New Testament amen Genesis chapter 2 verse 8 to verse 9 the Bible says the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden and there he put a man who he had formed and he had formed and out of the ground the Lord made every tree grow and that that that, that every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We find that in verse 16 of the same chapter that man was allowed to eat from every tree but not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil but if you are a bible scholar if you have read your bible you understand that this actually happened man went and ate the tree that he, god had told him not to eat from and that was the beginning of uh, that is where now the relationship uh, uh, between god uh, and man as of a father and as son was broken because what qualifies a son and a father is the aspect of birth is the aspect of nature and the bible says that god breathed into this clay that he had made and man became a living soul so adam was because of the breath of god and that is why he was qualified to be called the son of god because god was the genesis of his life that is why here on the earth if People want to have a baby. There has to be a seed. There has to be a, there has to be a seed. There has to be a union. And then a child is born. So out of the breath of God, Adam became a living soul. And that is why he was called the son of God. But you see now, after Adam, after Adam did whatever they did, after they, they disobeyed God, that life that God breathed into him came to an end. But the man continued to live. 
So if you looked at Adam the day before he disobeyed, and you looked at Adam the day after he, uh, before and the after he disobeyed, if you looked at him from the outside, he looked the same. But on the inside, the very essence of his being, there is, uh, there is something that had happened. That the, 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 what made him the son of God came to an end. And it was replaced by another nature, where what the Bible calls the nature of sin. Now fathers changed. Fathers changed because you can never be without a father. You may not know him. You may not like him. He may be an absent father, but you can never be without a father. So fathers changed. And this happened now. He, he, he stopped being the son of God and he became the son of the enemy. And Jesus speaking, he spoke to them and he told them, you are of your father the devil. He was not insulting them. He was giving a statement of fact. They had become sons of the devil. But God was not satisfied. As much as uh, his desire has been cut short a bit. He began, his he he began a journey of restoring man to that place of sonship. Because that was the original idea of God. Amen. That was the original idea of, man, of God. That even after the devil messed it, God did not give up on man. And I know there is somebody that is watching me this morning morning and you are saying pastor I have gotten to the end of my life Ah, uh -uh. just inv invite Jesus into your life and you will see the transformation he has he's able to make in your life it is not the end because we are still in that season where God is calling people back into that position of a sonship so I am here to reveal to Kenya I am here to reveal to this congregation the heart of of God you know the heart of a father Genesis chapter 3 verse 21 to verse 24 the Bible says and also for Adam and his wife the Lord God made tunics it is important for you to note that this was after he they messed up this was after the fall yeah, this was after the fall. But even after they had uh, disobeyed God, the heart of God towards them did not change. But what changed was the relationship of man and God. But God has always loved man. For the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So we find that God made tunics of skin and can they pay attention? The Bible says, and God himself, he did not wait for them to clothe themselves. Uh-uh, this is a fallen man. This is a man that has just disobeyed God. But God now gets into a place. There is blood that has to be shed. Speaking of what God, Jesus was going to do on that cross. But now this was a type. Now there's a blood that is shed. And now God takes that tunic. And now he begins to cover this man that has just disobeyed him. And the Bible says, and Lord God said, the man has become like one of us. To know good and evil. Before then, man did not know good or evil. Man just lived his life from the life of God that was resident in him. His life was an outflow of the life of God, the breath of God that had been breathed into him. So the Bible continues and says, And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed a cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which he turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. I know if you're a member of JCC, I have preached this before. But for the benefit of those who are watching us on Citizen Live, I want, like I said, I have come to present the, the aspect of the fatherhood of God. Because this man, after he has has seen that he has done what he was told not to do now God takes a tunic and covers this man and then the Bible says that this God because of his father's heart 
because of his love towards men the bible tells us that he drove this man you see the word drove makes people think that it was in anger that god was driving them no it was in haste that he was driving them out because he did not want them to stay in that garden and eat from the tree of life and live in their fallen state forever because if they had gotten remember now this man now he, he is he he has fallen and if he goes and eats from the tree uh, of life he was going to live forever and you know now the devil had become their father praise the name of jesus and now because the nature of sin was resident in them now they were able to attract diseases they were able to attract curses they were to able to attract everything that has its genesis in their father the devil Amen. So God, because he did not want to, for them to stay in that state forever. Can you imagine somebody suffering from cancer for eternity? Now that's a bad place to be. So God was like, ah, ah, now I know you are prone to diseases. Now I know you are prone to weaknesses. Now I know you are prone to everything that looks like your father did devil. So what I'm going to do because I love you, I'm going to get you out of this garden so that you don't eat from the tree of life and live forever in your fallen state so i'm gonna drive you out and i am gonna make this garden secure i'm gonna go and get an angel and this angel will make sure that you don't come back into the garden i'm not asking you not to come back into the garden not because i don't want you to eat the fruits thereof not because i don't want you to, to look at the beautiful trees but i don't want you to come back into the garden because i don't want you to eat from the tree of life and live forever in your fallen state if that is not love then tell me what love is because it is not the anger of god that cast them out it was the heart of the father who had already started uh, in his mind uh, and in his heart uh, the process of redeeming man to himself uh, and bringing this person uh, to becoming a, a, a son again uh, god has already started his process but he was like i need to protect this man i love this man he has fallen he has done that which is evil in my sight but i still love him so today if you are watching me if anyone has ever told you that god does not love you they lied i have come to tell you the truth that god may not like what you love what you are doing god may not like the things that you are doing but the love of god over your life is constant maybe you are nursing a hangover i want to tell you that god does not love this preacher more than they love you he loves you he lo our, the love that god has for me and the love that god has for you is the same so wake up arise and allow god to love you because he desires the aspect of his fatherhood to be revealed to them i might speak it to somebody in the house of god so we begin this journey and we find that in the old testament in the old testament the 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 the, the, the picture of god the picture and they have said this before to this congregation the picture of god is incomplete the picture of God is incomplete. Is incom it's not that it is incorrect, but it is incomplete. The people in the Old Testament, there is no one. Even the one that was called the friend of God. Even the one that spoke to God face to face. There is no one that would have said they have the full revelation of who God is. In the Old Testament, they knew him as a powerful God. They knew him as a mighty God. But there is nobody even Moses. There is nobody even Abraham who had the, 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 the privilege that we have of calling God Father. They did not, the, the, heart, the heart of God, the fatherhood of God was not completely revealed in the Old Testament. But how many thank God that we are not in the Old Testament? The book of Genesis chapter 8, I am making a case. For the fatherhood of God. Genesis chapter 8 verse 20 to verse 21. The Bible says. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. And took of every clean animal. And on a of every clean bird. And offered burnt offering on the altar. And the Lord smelt a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart. He did not tell in anybody. But he said in his heart amen i will never again cast the ground for man's sake 
You remember, he cast the ground in the same book of Genesis. But before we exit Genesis, God was like, "Uh, uh, I love this man too much. He will not be able to, to survive if this ground continues to be cast. So God blessed the ground for man's sake. He did not bless the ground for Noah's sake. It was not for Noah because he had offered an offering. No, it was not for Noah, but it was for man, meaning men, meaning every person. So I don't think it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's doctrinal to say you're blessing the ground. God bless it in Genesis. Rest your case. He, he, you, you, please just leave the ground alone. The ground is already... Yes, so you're the one to concentrate on yourself and see how blessed you are. And the ground is going to yield to you. So the ground can never be cast. Because who are you to cast what God has blessed? God, the Bible says, and God said, I will never again. Does God change? Is it the same yesterday, today, and forever? So God has never cast. And he said, as much for man's sake, although I will never cast it. Although the imagination of man's heart is evil. You are saying, I'm not blessing it because they are good. I'm blessing the, uh, the ground because I am good. I am blessing the ground because I'm their father. I am blessing the ground because I desire the best for them. So that is why God blessed the ground. Because, he, uh, because of his benevolence. Because of the, this nature of his... Not because of the nature of man. The man, even, uh, even this man by the name of Noah, even as he, was offering the, as he was offering the sacrifice, he was still a man under sin. The sin nature was still resident in him. So God says, I know that the imagination of a man's heart is evil from his youth. But God says, nevertheless, I will still bless the ground. I will never curse it. Nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done done so what am i saying people pay attention to what i'm saying uh, we are walking a journey this morning because i want to reveal to somebody that has been crying to god asking god why have you forsaken me oh god why have you left me i have come to open to you i may not be able to do everything but i want to open the heart of god to you so that you may see him as a loving father so that you may see him as a kind father so we find that after noah after after noah now god continues continues his his heart he's still seeking for sons okay but he did not find a son you know as much as he was obedient amen so god is still on the journey to redeem man to bring to get sons to be, bring people again to the position of sonship you know we we serve god but we are not servants please don't call me a servant of god that, that i don't like that please call me a daughter of god that makes sense I, I am a daughter of God who serves her father. You understand? We are sons and daughters who serve. But we are not purely servants. Amen. That's an insult to the cross. In, that, in other words, you are saying you are not restored to sonship. But if you know you are restored to sonship, you know you are a son that serves. You are a daughter that serves God. So we find that God, after Noah, he gets into another man. Now, God has started. He has started. He has continued with the journey that he started in the book of Genesis. Bible tells us in the book of Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to verse 3. Now, God finds a man. A man who had never heard of him. A man who had no reference to this God that we are talking about. And the Bible says that God goes to this man and speaks to this man. By this time, his name was Abram. The Bible says now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house. To a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make you and I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Like I've said God goes to a man. Who man is wondering who are you? I've never heard this voice before. 
I, I, no one has ever told me about this God. But God makes Abraham. By the, this time his name is Abraham. And this man re- believed a God that he had not seen. Because this was a nation of idol worshippers. There was a God of fertility. There was a God of rain. There was a God of everything. There was a God of everything. And then Abraham hears a voice. Get out of your country. This was a man of faith. Because this was the first time in his life he was hearing a voice because his gods were physical. Amen. But nevertheless, this man obeys God and comes out of his family and goes out and begins to follow God. So we find that from this time, even if you look at the journey of Abram, God was protecting him. And even of the children that came out of Abram, you find of Isaac, we find of Jacob, we find of the 12 tribes of, of, of Israel, we find that God is really protecting them because there is something that God is seeking for. And the, the, the obedience of Abraham did not satisfy the, God, the heart of God fully. Uh, he was like, uh, uh, you could have obeyed me, but you are not my son as yet. But I am seeking for sons. <laughs> Yes, I am not just seeking for obedient people. I am seeking for people that are like me. And God did not find one like himself in Abraham. He did not find one like himself in Abraham. He did not find one like himself in uh, if we, we did not find one like himself even in Moses. So we find that Abraham, we know the story and how the children of Israel now went into the land of captivity. The Bible tells us, the Bible tells in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. That is why the law was given. Because these people were a nation. I want to stop there and tell somebody that God now did, was not satisfied with a nation. No, he was not satisfied with the nation of Israel. He was not satisfied with what came out of Abraham. God was not satisfied with a nation and anybody would be satisfied with a nation. But God was not satisfied. He was seeking for a family. He was not satisfied with a nation because this nation was not his family. It was a nation. But it was not his family. So he protected this nation because out of this nation he would get a family. Are you understanding? Out of this nation there is a seed that he was protecting. Because out of this seed he was go- it, was, it would be the beginning of God enjoying what he un- had only enjoyed with one man whose name was Adam. Amen. So this is what God was looking for. So the Bible is telling me here that the law is made for is not made for the righteous person, for the lawless, uh, but for the lawless and the insubordinate, for the ungodly, for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, or for manslayers. So what am I saying? That God did not give the law as his best option. Law was not God's best choice, but it was the only choice then. Because the people that were coming from the land of Egypt, the ones that he had a great plan over, by the time they were coming, they fall in this this category that now Timothy tells us the reason as to why the law is given. They were sinners. Amen. They were a nation. They were people that God had chosen, but they were not the family of God. They did not have the nature of God. So we find that as they are coming from the nation of Egypt, going to the land of promise, because they are sinners. Amen. They don't have the nature of God. The things of the spirit are foolishness to them. They cannot be able to understand the things of the spirit. So that is why the law was given. The law was not given for the righteous. How many righteous people do I have? So why are you still following Moses? It's amazing that in the same breath somebody can say I am righteous. But in life they live as if it is Moses that is directing their life. Amen. So the law was given because these people were not righteous. But the church of Jesus Christ is called the righteousness of God. So because we are the righteousness of God, we don't need the law. 
I will say that again. Because we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, we do not need the law because we do not, we do not fall under the category of those that were given the law. No, the law that guides us right now is called the law of love. Amen. The law of love and the law of love does not come from outside in. The law of love comes from inside out because we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Is somebody with me this morning? Yeah, so we find that uh, as these people are coming, they are given the law because they needed, they needed to be given the law because the law had consequences. So they did not obey God because they, they loved God. They obeyed God because they feared the consequences. They did, not, they did not obey him because they loved him. They obeyed God because they could not... The one that amazes me is this, honey. That they could not pick... You could not pick sticks on, sun, on Sabbath. Because if you are seen picking sticks on Sabbath, you'd be killed. You still want the law? If you are seen picking sticks, you would be killed. That's why they did not obey God because they had a revelation of who he is. No, they did not obey God because they loved him. They did not obey God because they were his children. No, they obeyed God because they feared the consequences that came with the law. Because there were 613 that they had to follow. And every one of them had a consequence if you disobeyed. So they did not do it because they loved God. They feared, they did that because they feared the consequences. And they did not fear God in the sake of reverence. No, they feared God because of the punishment. Praise the name of Jesus. So we find that in the Old Testament, these people that were given the law, I said when I started that in the Old Testament, that the image of God was incomplete. Okay? It was that it was not, it is not that it was inaccurate, but it was just incomplete. Okay? It was incomplete. So we find that in, in the life of Abraham, if you are watching me via citizen, kindly listen to this one. In the life of Abraham, the only aspect he knew of God is this Jehovah Jireh. He is God, my provider. Because God provided a ram when he was about to kill his son. So the aspect of God that Abraham knew was that God is Jireh. You could never get Abraham from the conviction that God was Jireh because he had seen an aspect of God. But how many know that was just that was just an aspect? That was not the entirety of who God is. But God in the Old Testament, he revealed himself in bits and pieces to different people. So for Abraham, he did not know God as Shalom. No, he only he knew God as Jehovah Jireh because God had made provision when he needed provision. But we do not see him as calling him Jehovah Rapha because there is no time that Abraham was sick and he needed healing. So we find that in the aspect of healing, that is where we find Moses coming in and he begins to call God Rapha because he understood and not only understood but he experienced that aspect of God so as far as Moses is concerned if you went to Moses and you told him you know that God is Jehovah Jireh will be high I don't know that but I know him as Jehovah Nisi eh? I know him as Jehovah Rapha because that is an aspect of God that was revealed to Moses praise the name of Jesus and now when you went to Gideon and you told Gideon do you know that God is Jehovah Rapha. He will say, no, I don't think I know him that way. But if you ask me something, I can tell you that God is Jehovah Shalom because he has been my peace. Are you understanding somebody? Yeah, so these people, they were the nation of God. And because they were the nation of God, they understood different aspects of who God is. But they did not know the beauty of the heart of God. They just knew bits or an aspect of the heart of God. They just knew an aspect of the heart of God. But I thank God because God was still in the process. He was like Moses knows me as Rapha. Hey, ah, Moses Rose knows me as Rapha. Ah, and, uh, and Gideon knows me as Shalom. And Abraham knows me as Jireh. But in eternity, God was looking. But he was saying a time is coming. 
coming. A time is coming. There are people that shall be on the earth at a certain time. And they will not only know me as Rafa. They will not only know me as Jireh. They will not only know me as Shalom. They will not only know me as Mekadish Kem. They will not know me by those names. But I am coming down. I am coming down. I am coming down. This one I'm not sending an angel. I am coming down. I am going to represent myself to those people so that they can say ah, what they told us in the Old Testament was good, but it was not complete. Oh, so Jesus comes and he says, you know what? They knew God as this, but I have come to reveal the heart of God. I have come to reveal the fatherhood of God. Yes, in the Old Testament, if you do not know Jesus, if you do not understand the gospel, you might think that God is a mean God. But I have come to make a case for God, somebody. I have come to tell you the reason as to why people were killed in the Old Testament is because redemption was not available. So if somebody sinned, the sinner had to die because of the sin. Because you could not be able to separate sin from the sinner. That is why the Bible says that a witch was not allowed to live because there is no amount of conviction that would change the witch but right now we do not call we do not kill witches i know we do not call to kill witches we preach the gospel of jesus to them so that they can be saved and become sons of god but in the old testament if somebody was a witch they had to be killed because there was no possibility of change but right now in christ jesus god is able to separate the witch the witchcraft from the witch and that witchcraft comes to an end and the former witch becomes a daughter of God ah, becomes a daughter of God God is able to separate because of Jesus Christ so Jesus came to reveal the heart of God he came to reveal the, the heart, you know, the heart of the father. He came to reveal the heart of the father that was misrepresented, that was misunderstood in the Old Testament. Yes, but now Jesus comes and he says, you know what? My father has been misunderstood, but now I have come to represent him so that you can know him as he is. Luke chapter 1 verse 34 to verse 35. We all know that Jesus got born and all that. But because of time, I'm just going to jump into the book of Luke. The Bible says this is Mary Magdalene. And she was not a good girl. Hey, she was a girl that God had changed. You know, it's a woman that had experienced the goodness of God. The Bible says, and Mary said to the angel, remember this after Jesus died. And now this girl goes to the tomb. Okay. She's going to the tomb. The, the. Sorry, this is, a, this is Mary, the mother of, of Jesus. I'm sorry, there are two Marys I'm going to talk about today. I'm talking about Mary, the mother of the mother of Jesus. And Mary said to the angel, even they don't spoke to the angel, so they both spoke to the angel. <laughs> both of them. But this one spoke first. Praise God. How can this be? Since I do not know a man. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, because there shall be an overshadowing. Amen. Therefore, also, that Holy One who is to be born will call, be called the Son of God. The one that will be born will be called the Son of God. You see, if you look at the meaning of the Son of God, please go and study your Bible. Yeah, it is not meaning a, a, a small God, a small boy God. No. If you look at the meaning, it means God in the flesh. The one that shall be born shall be called God in the flesh. And now God in the flesh comes and he is born and he looks like any other Jew. 
If you were to look at Jesus, that is why in his hometown, they did not understand how he could be the son of God. Because he grew up like any other normal boy. And I hope you know he was a carpenter. Yeah, he made tables for people. There are some, there are some customers who came to his place and he had some tables made. So I was wondering how, how can he be the son of God? Yet the table that I am using to eat is the one who made for me. How can this carpenter's son be called the son of God? But the Bible says that the one that was born was called the son of God. God in the flesh. So when you look at Jesus, he was not different from the invisible God. And I will pause. He came, the God that they had worshipped, the God that they had heard about, now decided to put on flesh. Yes, a body thou hast given me. He, he got into a body, but he was God. He came as God in the flesh. And he grew up like any other Jewish boy. Yeah, he grew up like any other Jewish boy. But a time came that now, whatever he had been sent to do, now he had to begin to represent God and to present God here on the earth. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 to verse 4. The Bible says, God who at various times and in various ways so spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. He has in these last days spoken to us by his son. So the Bible is saying there was a time. There was a time. But if God was satisfied with that time, then he would not have sent his son. He would not have come in the flesh. But because he was not satisfied with speaking to the people through the prophets, he said, I have to come personally. I have to come in the flesh. And the Bible says, has in this last day spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world, who been the brightness of his glory and the express image, the express image of his person. What is the Bible saying? That if you looked at Jesus, you didn't need to ask him, how does God look like? But hello, God is not a Jew. God is not Jewish. So I'm not talking about the body that Jesus carried. You understand? The body that Jesus, Jesus expressed God in a Jewish body. So there is somebody today that is expressing God in a lower body. Amen. There is somebody that is expressing God in a, 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 a kikuyu body. Are you understanding? There is somebody that is expressing God in, in a kalenjin body. Are you understanding me? So Jewish, Jewish, this Jewish was a body that Jesus took. Amen. Because it is a nation that God has chosen. But Jesus was not the body. Okay, God was the was the, the was the God you could see in Jesus. Are you understanding? The God, but Jesus now came to express God in that Jewish body and upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had himself patched our sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So Jesus chose to come. Somebody tell your neighbor he chose to come. Yes, he chose to come. And I'm here to tell you that uh, actually the reason as to why he chose to come. You know, sometimes we see him coming and shedding the blood, which is good. He had to do that. It was important. There would be no redemption without the shedding part of the shedding of the blood. But sometimes we need to ask ourselves, why did he shed his blood? Why did he come? Why was he beaten? Why did all this happen? Why? The, the, the final result, the means, Jesus coming and doing all everything was a means to are desired end. Yeah, the desired end was to, to, to join the sons again back to their father. That was the ultimate. That was, Jesus did not come to heal, but he did. That was not his agenda. No. 
He did not just come to heal, no. He did not just come to raise his, the dead. He did, but that was his not ultimate. That was not the main reason why he came. He came so that he can come, he came and he, so that he can shed his blood so that man can be restored back to their original state where they have God as their father. Amen. The Bible says, as I begin to close, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going and how we and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you'd have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Hey, Philip. Jesus is telling him, from now on, no, not, not after I die. Mm -mm. Not after I go to the cross. Not after the resurrection. Jesus saying, and from now on, you know him and have seen him. So Jesus, in other words, was telling Philip, how can I walk with you all this time? And you have not seen the father in me. How? He was telling him, if you see me, you have seen the father. Amen. Then the Bible says, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. But now, this is the, this is the most important. I mean, I don't think I want to expound on everything. But there is something, and I see Jesus. I don't see Jesus telling Philip nicely. Philip. 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 If you, for how have I been with you for so long? I see Jesus putting a stern face. Like Philip. Philip. I have been with you so long. How daft can you get? I have been with you for so long. I have been with you for so long. And yet you have not known me, Philip. He was saying, Philip, all this time, I had an expectation that you would see the Father in me. That you would see the Father in me. So Jesus was saying, I am the way. You can never know the Father any other way. If you want to know the Father, oh, please see me. When you see me, you have seen the Father. Because the Father is spirit. You cannot be able to see him with your optical eyes. But I am God. He was telling Philip, I am the Father. I am the Father who took on flesh. Amen. Amen. And became the son, which means God in the flesh. I, now is that now making sense? I am, I am the father, okay? Who became the son, meaning God in the flesh. Now I am here. If I did not come, you would never have seen me. But here I am. I have put on a Jewish body. But I am the one that said, let there be. I am God. I am God. And if you look at the, in the book of Isaiah, the Bible says a, son is, uh, a child is born and a son is. And then the Bible tells us what he's going to be called. He was going to be called the everlasting father. But religion cannot take this. Ah, it is too big for religion. But Jesus is saying, if you see me, don't seek for the Father any other way. I'm the only way that you can be able to know the Father. You don't look for any other method of knowing God. And you can never know God outside Christ. You can never know, oh, me, I want Jehovah. Oh, I want Jehovah Jireh. But I don't want Jesus. You will never know him any other way. For according to what Jesus has revealed, I am the way, the only way that you can be able to know God. You can never know God outside me. Jesus said, you can never know God outside, outside Christ. So when you look at Christ, you see God. When you look at Christ, you see the heart of God revealed to man. For man to be able to see, for man to be able to experience. Am I speaking to somebody here? 
Hallelujah. Jesus tells, speaking in the book of Luke, chapter 4 and verse 16 to verse 20. The Bible says he came to Nazareth. I'm telling you, I'm just projecting and seeing the heart of God. The fatherhood of God. The Bible says he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And his custom was he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. Where he had, when he, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to the recovery of sight to the blind. This is physical and spiritual. Amen. Hallelujah. To set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And the Bible says Jesus closed the book. But if he had not closed the book, the next verse, because he was referring to Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1 to 2. It says, give us verse 2 of Isaiah 61 verse 2. This is a part that Jesus left out. It's not because he didn't want to read. But he had come to change everything. Amen. The Bible says, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. Jesus did not come for the day of vengeance. No. But he reached to that place where he said to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Because God was saying, now you didn't know me. But now I have come to, uh, to proclaim the acceptable year. Don't focus on the vengeance. The vengeance will happen. If you are not in Christ... By the time rapture is happening, if you are not in Christ, by that time, you will know vengeance. Praise the name of Jesus. But Jesus said, it is not the time for vengeance. This is a time that I have come to declare the heart of God. I have come to tell you that this is the acceptable. Meaning, everything else that happened previously was not acceptable. Because if the year, you know, this year means it's not 20, 12 months. No, it's a dispensation. So if the dispensation of the law was acceptable to God, then that is what he would have called acceptable. But he's saying, now I have been waiting to proclaim that, was, that which has always been acceptable in the eyes of God. And that which has always been acceptable in the eyes of God was a dispensation of the grace of God. Was a dispensation. Jesus came to introduce a dispensation. And he came to introduce the dispensation of the grace of God. And this, her law, is the acceptable dispensation. Before God, it is acceptable dispensation that is what jesus came to introduce and how does this dispensation look like this dispensation looks like this it looks like i came i died I came, I died. You did not even pray for me to die. But I chose to come and die for you. And he is saying now, I have, I'm inviting you to a place. A place that you did not pay any price for. A place that I am just welcoming you to come and enjoy the goodness of God. Now, that is how the grace of God looks like. This is not the time for vengeance. This is a time that God is opening his arms. And today he is opening his arms to the nation of Kenya. And he is telling Telling you for the one who did not know that for almost two thousand years, for almost two thousand years, this dispensation has been revealed to man, has been made available to man. But you have to make a choice to be part of this wonderful dispensation, this dispensation of the love of God. You know, grace means love gifts. This is a time that God has gifted us so that we can be able to see His heart. Praise the name of Jesus. Yes, he has come to see his heart. But you know the reason as to why I'm saying it's a dispensation that Jesus was coming to reveal. He did not just call the dispensation into place. No. He, he, he bathed the dispensation. It was a painful bath on the side of Jesus. 
Oh yes, it was a ninth. It was it was a painful birth because Mark tells us in Mark chapter 15 and verse 4, 34, the Bible says, At the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But even before this happened, we find what Peter is talking about, that he, he himself bore our sins in 1 Peter 2, 24, in his own body on the tree that we having died to sins might live for righteousness by whose stripes you are healed you see you don't read the bible says you were healed so meaning you were healed 2000 years ago that's why when you pray for the sick we ask them to receive healing because healing was released 2000 years ago Salvation was re released, Tooth was made available 2,000 years ago. And that is why even when you get saved, we don't ask you to confess your sin. We ask you to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So two, almost 2,000 years ago, healing was released. But this healing was not released because Jesus spoke it into being. It was released because he became that thing. Yes, he became that thing. He put his back out there and he was beaten it was not a painful thing it was not a pay it was not a simple price for him to pay it was painful but he said i am gonna do this so that in the year 2024 anybody who is attacked by cancer they can receive their healing i am gonna go there i am go i'm not go i don't want carol to receive the stripes herself i don't want mark to receive the stripes himself i don't want mary to receive the stripes himself herself but I, I am the one who has come to represent the heart of God. And I, as God in the flesh, I am going to go and pay the price. I am going to go and receive those stripes so that if diabetes comes, oh, you tell diabetes, hello, diabetes, I was healed 2,000 years ago. And because I was healed 2,000 years ago, not because of what I did, but because of what Jesus did in my place, I receive my healing from diabetes. I receive healing from high blood pressure. I receive my healing because it is not now that Jesus is releasing healing. Healing has been around for almost 2,000 years ago. It is up to you to know and understand that we are not in the dispensation of vengeance. We are not in the time of the law, but we are in the time that God has showered us with his love gifts. It's for you to receive by faith and say, God, you gave it to me. I receive it and it is mine. And I will begin to walk in it because I did not pay for it. I am receiving it by faith. Jesus came to reveal the heart of God. And he did not just tell us words, but he did it by action. He went and he was beaten. And you know, it's amazing that he first dealt with sickness before he became the sin nature. After he was beaten, he said, now I am done with diseases. Now I am walking up Golgotha. And as I walk Golgotha, I see, I see somebody being delivered. I see somebody becoming a son of God. I see because had he paid for the price, had he paid, had he received the stripes and not gone to the cross, you would not be a son of God. You would not be a daughter of God. But he went all the way to the cross. And as the Romans were nailing him on the cross, eh, the Bible says he cried out, Aloy, Aloy, Lama Sabakthani, God my father because he's the only one who was qualified at this time to call him father he said my father oh, why have you forsaken me but he, as he was crying out he understood the reason 
Oh, for he said, go and do it. And after you have done it, I will give you the nations as an inheritance. So this time, Jesus told Mary, do not touch me. I have gone to the cross. But I have to bring proof. Hey, I have to bring proof. I have to go to the heavenly sanctuary. And I have to present all oh, the blood in the heavenly sanctuary. And there is some time pastor demonstrated that it is a priest that was cutting his own blood in the presence of his father. And when that blood now went into that heavenly sanctuary, oh, the deal was sealed. And now, after the deal was sealed the devil cannot tell you you are not the son of God because Jesus told Mary I go not to my father only but I am going also oh, to your father and he told Mary go and tell my brethren not my servants not my friends but go and tell my brethren that I go that I am going I am going to your father and I am going to my father too I have come to tell somebody that God has been misrepresented our God is a loving God oh when Jesus said it is finished it was actually finished and now the Bible tells me that now I have the spirit of his son oh I have the spirit because when he went and he paid the price and the blood was accepted oh yes then he was given the permission to pour the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit was poured in the Old Testament oh God was only in that room where they could visit once a year but there was a prison break hey, there was a prison break God said you know it is only my one man that has been understanding that has been able to experience my Shekinah glory but as Jesus was crying out it is finished there was a tearing in the temple from top to bottom because God said from now henceforth they will not come to one place but I am gonna be everywhere I'm gonna be in Japan in Kenya in Uganda in Tanzania all at the same time right now God does not believe in temples made with hands but he lives in the created spirits he lives in the boy in the recreated spirit he lives in mary carol james john whoever you are now god does not live in temples made with human hands but now he lives in me i promise you i'm not six foot tall but i promise you i carry god and so do you if you were born again you carry the creator of the universe so god is telling you why we call him abba father is because he does not lead us from outside now he guides you from the inside he fathers you from the inside you don't have to go to a mountain he fathers you he gives you direction because the father and his spirit they are one so he fathers you he guides you he instructs you from your inside from your recreated spirit now god communicates to you and through you i have come to tell you that god is a father And you have his spirit crying out from within you, Abba. Jesus was the only one who could call him Abba. But now, you can call him Abba. And if you're watching me by a citizen right now, YouTube, Facebook, you've never had the opportunity to call him Abba. You don't have to be beaten. You just need to receive the benefits of the crucifixion of Christ. Today, you are watching me. You have done so many bad things. And you're wondering, Pastor, can I be redeemed? It is possible. It is possible. God has been waiting for you to come back home. If you repeat this prayer after me, whether you're watching me from prison, hospital, wherever you're watching me, 
God shall become your father. The same way he is my father and the father to all those that call on the name of Jesus. Repeat this prayer after me. Say, dear Lord Jesus. And even if you're here, you also pray the same as they do it on television. Say, dear Lord Jesus, today, I believe that you came and you died. And on the third day, you rose up from the grave. Today, I receive the forgiveness of sin. And I receive eternal life into my spirit by faith in the name of Jesus. Now, I cannot sign out. If you are sick in your body, stretch your hand to the, to the gadget you're using to watch me and touch the part of your body right now that is ailing. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke sickness right now. Cancer, I command you to leave that body. Diabetes, I command you to leave. I command the blind to see right now. I command the cripples to stand up and walk right now in the name of Jesus. Father, you confirm your word with miracles, signs and wonders. Right now, I speak against skin conditions. I come against mental conditions right now. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, you spirit of infirmity that has afflicted the person that is stretching their hand towards the television. I come against you right now in the name of Jesus Christ. And I command you to leave that person right now. And right now, I release the healing power of God all the way to Mombasa to Kisumu to Kakamega or to the northern part of this nation wherever you are watching me I release the healing power of God right now receive your healing in the name of Jesus 